So Mandy and I have come to something of an understanding in our marriage. That sounds a little bit more ominous than I intended it to, but uh, <clears throat> the two of us, we have an agreement that we've, we've come to about a time in our lives that we know is coming, but neither one of us is really looking forward to. Mandy and I have an agreement that I have to be the one to die first. Man, that's even more ominous than beforehand, right? We're off to a really hot start this morning. But we've reached this, this, this discussion that we've had this discussion several times, and I've, I've been very blunt with my wife when I've told her that I have to be the one who dies first in our marriage. And I would love to tell you that I feel that way because of some deeply romantic ideology that I just can't stand the thought of living without her. I mean, that's true, but that's not why I told her that I have to be the one to die first. See, I told Mandy, my beautiful, my amazing, my gorgeous wife, that, that I have to be the one to die first because I was just terrible at the whole dating thing the first go around, and I can't imagine that I've gotten any better without any practice. Like, genuinely, I, I was not a very good dater. I was not good at the dating part. I was a great boyfriend when we finally got to that point, but it was that whole transition from I like this person to we're a couple now. I had no idea what to do, and I honestly feel like I was lied to as a kid, if I'm being real with you, because I had been taught by family and friends and other people that dating was supposed to be all kinds of fun. It was supposed to be the best time of your life. It was supposed to be nice and light. And then I reached the age of dating, and I learned that dating was very awkward and uncomfortable and anything but fun. It's probably because my default setting as a, as a human being is I'm just constantly stuck on awkward. When you grow six inches in less than three months, you tend to fall down a lot. And I find that girls don't really like it when you fall down in front of them. They're good if you fall for them, not when you fall in front of them. So awkwardness was just always a part of it. The idea of, of trying to tell a girl that I liked her, that I wanted to date her, it was just too much for me. I didn't know what to do. Maybe your experience was different. Maybe you think back fondly on your dating life. I don't. So I have to be the one that dies first. For instance, let me, let me tell you a little story. This is probably, this is uncomfortable for me to share because this gives you a window into how awkward I truly was during my dating portion of my life, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. There was a girl in college that when I went to college at Johnson that I I had just the biggest crush on. I, I was crushing on her super hard. Uh, we had several of the same classes. We hung out with a lot of the same people. We were in each other's orbit quite a bit. When I first saw her, I thought she's kind of cute. As I got to know her a little bit more through these times of hanging out with these people, I thought, oh, we have a ton of things in common. And then one day in particular, I was sitting in a class, and don't ask me the context of it, that's a whole other story in and of itself, but this particular girl admitted in class with multiple witnesses that she didn't want to date a sporty, muscle-bound jock guy. She didn't want to date a super skinny skater punk. That she wanted to date a dorky guy with a little extra, as she put it, fluff. <laughs> so, I felt like as a dorky guy who loves to read comic books and watch pro wrestling and has maybe got a little bit more than extra fluff, that I'm clearly exactly what she's looking for. I'm the total package. Sup, girl? So what should I do in this situation? I mean, obviously I should ask this girl out, right? Obviously I should, I should, you know, man up. I should approach her, ask to speak with her separately, say, hey, what do you think about going and getting some coffee or maybe watching a movie together or just hanging out sometime, just you and I? That's what a normal person would do in this situation, Right? When you find out that the person that you have a crush on is kind of attracted to people that look an awful lot like you, that's what a normal person would do, is just go and ask them out. As you can probably guess, that's not what I did. No, 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 I decided to take things in a much less mature and a much less dignified manner whatsoever. See, I had a buddy, a guy buddy, I should say, who was friends with that girl's roommate. So I decided to leverage that relationship there, and I asked my friend, this is so middle school, no, I'm sorry, this is, this is elementary school, this is even, and I was at college, so this is really bad, and this is Bible college too, the fact this girl wasn't already engaged was a minor miracle in and of itself. 
but I asked my friend to ask his friend to ask her roommate if she liked me. <laughs> Mandy, I have to die first, okay? <laughs> okay, that's the agreement. You all heard it, she agreed to it. Um, I was nervous about the answer that I would receive because I wasn't comfortable enough to ask her out and face the possibility of rejection. I wanted to know the answer before I asked the question. And so I was super nervous about it. Um, I was crushing really hard on this gal, and the idea that she liked guys that looked like me just gave me that hope that maybe this would turn out well for me. And so I was actually in my friend's room while his friend was talking to her roommate. Wait, while her roommate was talking to her. There we go. That's it. The whole chain thing is getting confusing even to me. And this gal, the roommate of the girl I was crushing on, was kind enough to actually like kind of text us an ongoing thread of what the conversation was going. And, and so I was sitting there in my friend's room excited to hear that, yeah, she likes me. She kind of digs me. She thinks that I'm cool. Nobody ever thought that I was cool, but it's a nice thought. My heart kind of sank as soon as we got the first answer, though, because the first answer to the question of, hey, what do you think about Brandon was Who? Mm. I was around this girl quite a lot. We had a lot of the same classes. We hung out with the same people. I knew enough about her to have a crush on her. She didn't know who I was. And after the conversation progressed and the, the roommate decided to give her a little bit more detail as to who it was she was talking about, she finally responded, oh, him. Um, he's okay, I guess. See, that's not the kind of relationship I was looking for. I crushed so hard on this girl and the thought of the idea that she could be interested in guys that look like me, it had me thinking this relationship could go a whole different path. That maybe this whole thing would end with wedding bells, a white picket fence, and the whole nine yards. But the fact remains that even though we'd spent a lot of time together, even though she had an idea of who I was, she didn't know who I was. She didn't know me well enough to really formulate an opinion about who I truly was in that, in that idea. The best they could muster was... He's okay, I guess. It's a hard thing to, to try to start a relationship like that, isn't it? When one side believes the relationship should be one thing, but the other one, the only thing that they can muster is he's okay, I guess. And yet, for a lot of people, this is how they tend to treat Jesus. You'd be hard-pressed in our culture and our context to find people who aren't at least vaguely aware of Jesus and some of the things that he did. They may not have gotten the full truth of who Jesus is. They may not know exactly who he is, but they know enough that they formulated an opinion. And for a lot of folks, their opinion of Jesus is, well, he's okay, I guess. See, if you talk to a lot of people outside of the church, people who, who don't identify Jesus as being the Son of God, they may be able to tell you things like, well, he's a good moral teacher, or they might even be able to say that he was somebody who tried to help others and, and tried to inspire his followers to do the same. That Jesus was somebody who genuinely cared about people. But the reality is, is that these folks have formulated this opinion without really knowing who Jesus is. In their mind, he's okay, I guess. But they don't know the truth. They don't even scratch the surface of who Jesus actually is. But these folks, they're not the only ones. The people in our culture, our context today, they're not the only ones who miss the mark on identifying who Jesus is. In fact, people who saw Jesus firsthand, people who witnessed the things that he did, who heard the things that he said, still missed the idea of who he was. We're eventually going to land in, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. So if you want to get your Bible out and turn it there, that'd be great. But, but we're going to kind of get an idea of, of what it is here, because I think we need to understand what these people were able to see and try to figure out how they still missed the mark on it. Because if you look at just the gospel of Mark alone, Jesus builds up quite a resume before we ever get to Mark chapter 8. Jesus does quite a lot of things in an effort to try to show people who he truly is so that people can come to get to know him and find out what he's all about. Jesus did so many things before we ever even get to Mark chapter 8. While he's in Capernaum, there's a crowd of people surrounding him. He drives out an unclean spirit from a guy who's been tormented by one for quite some time. Right in front of the midst of everybody. While he's also in Capernaum, he heals a woman that everybody assumes is on her deathbed. 
She's got a fever. They can't get rid of it. Nothing they know how to do is helping her. And so they just assume she's going to die. And then Jesus heals her. He gets to the point of of being so popular just in Capernaum that Mark chapter 1 verses 32 through 33 say, When evening came after the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and demon possessed. And then it says in verse 33, and don't miss this, the whole town was assembled at the door. The whole town of Capernaum, of everybody that was there, witnessed these things that Jesus was doing. They saw firsthand him healing the sick, him getting demons removed from people who had it. But Jesus didn't just stay in Capernaum. He went around to other places, places like Gerasen, where he drove out a multitude of demons from a guy who had been hurting from them for years. A guy who identified themselves as legion because there were so many demons that were wrestling within this man's spirit. A guy who developed a reputation in his community as being that crazy guy who is completely stark naked and hangs out in the graveyard. These demons drove him to do things like harming himself and harming others whenever he could. And in one encounter with Jesus, one moment with Jesus, the next time this town sees this guy who they've always assumed is just the crazy guy, they see him dressed and in his right mind, and everybody freaks out because of that. They saw him yesterday as this, today they see him as this, and it messes with their brains because of this one encounter with Jesus. He does so much more. He heals the deaf. He stops a woman's bleeding who's been bleeding for 12 years. A woman whose friends and family had to know that she was in misery and in pain. Over and over again, he stops that bleeding in one encounter. And he does that while he's on his way to go raise a dead girl. Like dead dead. Like she has an encounter with Jesus and she's alive. There's people gathered outside of their house because she's the daughter of a synagogue leader who know that she's dead, who are mourning the fact that she's dead, and then they see her. That's got to mess with you, right? In our culture and context, we would just say zombie and run away. She was dead. She's alive because of Jesus, and multitudes of people witnessed this sort of thing happening. They saw everything that Jesus did. He fed over 5,000 people with what amounts to a small lunch. And if you don't think that people will talk about getting a free meal, you don't know people very well. He does all of these things in front of sometimes thousands of people who witness what Jesus is able to do. But it's not just the things that Jesus does that, that get people's attention. Beyond his miracles, Jesus was gaining notoriety for his preaching and for his teaching. In this time period and in this region, if you were a religious leader, a rabbi, or a teacher of some kind, and you had kind of a new take on the Word of God, if you had something to share about the Word of God that had never been heard by people before, people would want to hear it. They'd come from wherever they could to come and listen from you. And in fact, and we oftentimes miss this, I think, when we read the Gospels, most of the miracles that Jesus performs are interruptions. They're interruptions to the the teachings that he's giving. Like Jesus didn't just walk by and see 5,000 hungry people and say, hey, let's feed them. Those 5,000 people came to listen to what Jesus had to say. And then they all started getting hungry. His message was something that was unheard of in that region. People couldn't believe the things that he was saying about how the kingdom of God was drawing near to them. About how God longed to be restored to sinners. He taught in parables, telling stories about things that people in that time period could relate to in order to teach them about things that they didn't understand yet. Jesus taught in such a way that was completely different from everybody else, and people wanted to hear from it. And Hundreds, if not thousands of people would gather around him everywhere that he went just to hear what the man had to say. And if that's not enough, if beyond these things, beyond these miracles, beyond these sorts of things, if you can look past the idea that he raised the dead, that's kind of a hard one for me to get past. The thing that would stand out most to people beyond what he did, what he said, was who he hung around. See, Jesus so often went to people that were known and notorious sinners in their area. And it wasn't like he just happened to come by them. It wasn't like he just happened to be around them. It was almost like... Like he was actively seeking them out. Like he was making a beeline right for these people that other Pharisees, religious leaders didn't want anything to do with. 
it was kind of known around his circles that, that Jesus hung around sinners because we read in Mark chapter 2, verse 16, it says, The scribes who were Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, and they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? It was known that one of his closest followers, one of the inner 12, one of the people that was tightest with Jesus was a tax collector for the government of Rome. And I don't think I, you've heard me talk about it over and over again. You've you've heard other people talk to you about just how bad tax collectors were, but I don't think we understand just how much people in that time period, people from Israel hated tax collectors. So the notion that a a Jewish leader, a Jewish rabbi, a a teacher of the law of God would invite a tax collector to be one of his disciples was completely unheard of, and it got people's tongues wagging. People would say things like, can you believe he's got this guy with him? Can you believe that he's hanging around those people? Doesn't he know what they do? Doesn't he know who they are? That's who Jesus wanted to be around. Almost like he had to be around them. Almost like they were the very people he came there to see. Jesus was so different. He differentiated himself from every known teacher, every known spiritual leader, and even just every person of that time period in every way humanly possible. There was clearly something different about this dude. But the question becomes is, Do these people really know him? Do they know who he is? They've seen what he could do. They've heard what he has to say. They've seen who he's been around. But do they know him? And so it kind of makes sense that by the time we get to Mark chapter 8, that Jesus decides to do a little market research. He decides to ask his disciples a a really poignant question that we see in Mark 8.27. It says, Jesus went out with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? That's a really intriguing question if we think about it, right? Like out of all the questions that Jesus could have asked about what people think about him or or what kind of person they think he is, he asks, who do they say I am? He doesn't ask, what do people say about me? He doesn't ask, how are people responding to what I've done? He asks, who do they say that I am? People are talking. He knew that was going to happen. And he decided to ask the question, who do these people say that I am? It's a recognition that people are talking about him, and he wants to make sure that they know exactly who it is that they're talking about. Jesus is given three distinctly different ideas of people that he might be. His disciples come back with answers that, that on the surface, at least for us in our context, they don't make a lot of sense to us. But If we really take a look at what it was going on in that time period, if we really take a look at what was going on in that region, they actually kind of make a lot of sense. See, the first answer that Jesus has given is some people say that you're John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist and Jesus, they were actually contemporaries of each other. They were two known religious leaders who were both known for being kind of different. John liked to wear skins and eat bugs. Jesus just raised the dead. I mean... And it kind of makes sense that they'd be known together because they are also pretty close in age. If you recall from your beginning of of Luke chapter 2, or Luke chapter 1, excuse me, when Mary finds out that she's pregnant and that she's going to give birth to the Son of God, she goes to Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John. Elizabeth actually says that at the sound of Mary's voice, the baby that's within her leapt and, ow, any lady who's ever had a baby move within their belly and hit things that they're not supposed to hit, the baby jumped. Ow, right? Nobody else remembers that? Okay, cool. But they've known each other for their entire lives. John the Baptist and Jesus have been around each other a lot. But for the most part, John the Baptist kind of stuck around the Jordan River. He was known for his baptisms. He was known for what he would have to say about religious leaders. He was known for what he would, the message that he would give, which was somewhat similar to Jesus. And so maybe these people are thinking, after so many years of doing the way he's been doing things, maybe John's decided to take it on the road. So it kind of makes sense that they would think that Jesus might be John the Baptist. But then they go on and they say, but others also say that you might be Elijah. 
Now, in our idea, this may be a little bit harder for us to understand, but there are many people who identify Jesus with the prophet Elijah. And honestly, if we take a look at this, this does make some sense in a couple of different ways. First off, Jesus is openly and even fearlessly defiant of the religious leaders that have been there, similar, at least in some ways, to how Elijah was defiant and at least on the surface appeared to be fearless as he would go and denounce King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. That he's not afraid of that confrontation of people who are in authority over others. He's not afraid to call them out when they're wrong. He's not afraid to tell them that they're sinning. But beyond that, when Elijah was staying with a widow, he had, he had a widow who was running out of flour and oil, two major components for eating. Again, remember that this was a drought taking place, crops were not growing, which means flour ain't coming in. And the woman actually told Elijah when he asked her to make him some bread, she said, I'm actually going to make one more meal for me and my kids and then we're going to die. And Elijah said, that's not going to happen. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 15 and 16, we read, So he proceeded, or she proceeded, to do according to the word of Elijah. Then the woman Elijah and her household ate for many days. The flour jar did not become empty. The oil jug did not run dry. According to the word of the Lord, had, he had spoken through Elijah. This is a miracle involving the multiplying of food. This is the idea that, that God, through Elijah, is making this food supply continue to grow. And we've just seen Jesus... Multiply food himself. That he was able to feed 5,000 people with what would be a small meal for a small family. Jesus has multiplied food much in the way that Elijah has done that. But it's even more than that. Because not long after the, the bread thing with Elijah and the widow, the widow's son died. He passed away. And a widow in her anguish comes to Elijah asking that he do something. And Elijah pleads with God to raise the boy. And in 1 Kings 17, 22, it says, So the Lord listened to Elijah. The boy's life came into him again, and he lived. Elijah raised the dead. And Jesus has also raised the dead. In front of a, a multitude of people who saw a girl who was dead, now they see her alive because of Jesus. And it kind of sounds a lot like when Elijah did the same thing. And as a reminder, in case you don't remember this, Elijah never actually died. He was taken up into heaven in a chariot of fire, which I still think would be the coolest thing to ever show in a movie, but nobody's done it yet. He never actually passes away. And so it's, it's kind of understandable that people of Israel would believe that maybe Elijah, this great prophet from the time gone by, has come back. Has come back amongst his people and has come back to restore the word of God to them. And even still the third idea that the disciples give Jesus as to who the people say that he is, it makes sense too. Because they say some others call you a prophet. Jesus, at the very least, to some of these people, some of these people, he, he still reminds them of the prophets of old. They've heard about what prophets have done. They've heard these stories over and over again about prophets performing miracles, about prophets talking about the law of God, about prophets going in and sharing a message, and prophets going and then hang out with people that they were not supposed to be. And it's been 500 years since a prophet had been in their midst. It's not the first time there ever been a drought of prophets in the nation of Israel, but it's been 500 years, and so it's, it's natural for these people to think, you know what, maybe finally, after all this time, God has sent us a prophet to give us a word from the Lord when we need it most, to lift up our hopes and our spirits as we're laboring under the yoke of Rome. They think that Jesus might just be a returning prophet, that he's, he's come and just as what God has done in the past, and he's been inspired by God to go and spread the word of God to the people of God. It's understandable why people would think all these three different things about Jesus, that he might be John the Baptist, that he might be Elijah, that he might be a prophet. It's understandable, but it's wrong. Because none of these, none of these identifiers even come close to identifying who Jesus is. They don't even scratch the surface. They're the he's okay answers. 
Because none of these people have actually taken the time to get to know Jesus. They've seen what he can do. They've heard what he's got to say. They've even seen who he hangs around. But they don't know him. They've not been around him. They've not discovered who he actually is. And so it raises the question, who is Jesus? It's a question that's been asked for 2,000 years and counting. It's a question that nearly every person who's ever lived from the time of Jesus till afterwards has probably asked themselves at least once. If they've heard about Jesus and heard the name of Jesus, they've probably asked the question, who is Jesus? And again, as every person in our culture and our context has encountered this question, they've come to some sort of a conclusion. But as we think about this question, I think it's important that we actually change that question a little bit. Because when we want to find out who is Jesus, maybe we got to ask, who did Jesus say he is? Right? If you want to get to know somebody, if you actually want to get to know more about them, if you want to develop a relationship with them, you got to ask, who are you? And you can't get that information from outside sources. Sometimes you got to go straight to the to the heart of it yourself. So we got to find out who did Jesus say he is. And Jesus was never shy about that particular question. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. That's a big statement. That is a huge statement to under, understand. Jesus in this moment is, is putting himself on equal footing. Not just equal footing, but he's actually saying that me and God were the same. We are equal to one another. That when you look at me, you look at the Father. Jesus tells his followers that I am on the same level as God because I am God made flesh. He goes even further uh, uh, in another place. He invokes the name of the Father of all of Israel in John chapter 8, verse 58. He says, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And using those words, I am. Oh man. Jesus harkens back not only to Abraham, but he harkens back to Moses as he leaned or as he kneeled in front of the burning bush, as the voice of God was telling him to go into Egypt and to free his people. And Moses said, Who do I say sent me? God responded, I am. In this sentiment, Jesus has already just said, I'm above Moses. I'm above Abraham, because before either of them. I am. Jesus was not shy about the idea of telling people that he was the son of God, that he was God in flesh, that he was Emmanuel, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ. This is who he says he is. When Jesus is asked the question, who are you? This is his response. I and the Father are one. Which really leaves us, as the listeners of Jesus, it leaves us with only two choices. There's no third option, there's no idea. There's only two choices that we get when it comes to the question of who is Jesus. Either he is who he says he is. Either he is God made flesh, either he is the Emmanuel, either he is the Christ, either he is the Messiah, or he's not. There's no riding the fence on the question who is Jesus. There's no he's okay, I guess. Because if Jesus is not who he said he is if, he is, if he is not the Messiah, if he is not God made flesh, if he is not Emmanuel, then he probably knew that, right? And that would make him a liar. That would make him somebody who, who spreads lies about himself. And last time I checked, lying is wrong, right? I think from the time we're three years old and we first formulate some of our first lies, we're taught from our parents that lying is wrong. There's not a person alive who would tell you that lying is a moral act. And so if Jesus is a moral teacher, but what he says is a lie, then he can't be both. But not only that, for those who say he was somebody who tried to help people, well, last time I checked, there have been a lot of people who've died because they believe that Jesus was who he said he was. His closest followers all died horrible deaths because they refused to say anything other than he is the Christ. So if he's lying about it and that lie is costing people their lives, well, then he can't be a good guy. 
If Jesus is not who he said he is, we cannot call him a good moral teacher. We cannot call him somebody who tries to help people. If the answer to the question is he's okay, I guess, because he's a good moral teacher, well, he can't be. But if he is who he says he is, if he is exactly who he says he is, if the answer to the question, who is Jesus, is in fact, He is the Messiah. He is God made flesh. He is the Son of God come to earth. And that changes everything for us and how we approach him. It changes everything about the ways that we we talk about Jesus. It, It means that everything that he said and did needs to be taken note of. It means that everything that he said and did means so much more. It means that everything that he told us about how we are to live our lives maybe is something we ought to take into consideration. Because if we have God made flesh telling us how to live, maybe we ought to listen to it. Right? If we want to find out how a, a, an engine works or how a piece of machinery works, we tend to go to the manufacturer, do we not? Because the people who built it ought to know. So if we want to find out the way our lives are supposed to go, maybe we ought to go talk to the guy who built us. And if Jesus says this, if the answer to the question, who is Jesus, is exactly who he said he is, then it means that everything he said and everything he did has huge weight behind it. There is no casual approach to Jesus. He didn't give us that option. He didn't casually approach us. He didn't casually present himself to the world. Far too many people in our culture, in our context, treat Jesus so flippantly and so casually because they've never actually asked themselves the question, who is Jesus? They formulated an opinion over misinformation or small amounts of information. And I think the reason why that is, why more people aren't asking the question, who is Jesus, and why people aren't really trying to investigate that answer is because those of us who claim him, those of us who carry his name, we've done a pretty awful job of representing him. We've not been the kind of people who can carry the name of Jesus into a world that is going to inspire them to want to know Jesus more. Because we're not living the way that Jesus told us to. And likely, that is because so many of us have never actually taken the weight of what Jesus says. We've become comfortable with Jesus. He's kind of become a mascot to us. Mascots are cool, they're good for getting people to cheer, but there's not a lot of depth there. If Jesus is who we claim him to be, then the people who should be taking what he said and what he did most seriously is us. So that we can show the world that Jesus is who he said he is. So that when they're asked that question, they actually want to find out because his followers are doing things that are just so different than the rest of the world because his followers are are able to do things that they shouldn't be able to do because his followers are saying things that people need to hear because his followers are going and associating themselves with people that others don't. We can't say that Jesus is just okay, I guess. Because if Jesus is who we claim him to be, And we have to let that truth change us. Maybe your approach for so long has been Jesus is okay. Maybe your approach to this relationship has always been he's okay. The thing about saying somebody's okay is you can keep an arm distance that way. But if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, we have to let that truth transform us. It means that we got to go to what he had to say. And then we can't miss this part because this is where a lot of Christians miss it. We have to do what he said for us to do. That's rough, isn't it? But if he is who he says he is, if his message is what he says it is and it's coming from the source that he says it's coming from, we can't miss that. We can't ride the fence 
We can't say he's okay, I guess. The Apostle Paul would write about Jesus and who he is and what our response should be to him so beautifully for us in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And we'll close with it today. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory. Don't miss how Paul labels Jesus here. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. 